Many would say that they respect the person of Jesus Christ here in America, uh, but very likely they might have a skewed understanding of, of who this person is. Uh, what should we understand about who Jesus is? What can you say about him this morning? Just in a word or two, who is Jesus Christ? He's the Son of God. He is the Son of God, God the Son. Okay? He is our Savior. He, is our Savior. he came to save his people from their sins. That was his great uh, mission. He's our expected bridegroom. We don't know when he's okay, an expected bridegroom. That's a great image as we think of the second coming of the Lord, coming to take his bride to be with himself at the rapture. Anything else that you could say about the person of Jesus Christ? Most high. He is the Most High. No name uh, given among men that's any greater than his. Anything else? He was a gift. A gift from God. Certainly the best of all gifts. Any uh, sacrifice for redemption. Okay. Perfect sacrifice for our redemption. Remember in the Old Testament, sacrifices, animal sacrifices had to be offered again and again and again. And they covered the sins of the people for a time but Christ became a perfect sacrifice for us. Anything else concerning the person of Christ? A man of peace. A man of peace. That's a good word, isn't it? Prince of peace, in fact, uh, in Isaiah chapter 9. Creator. He's our creator. We see that so clearly in uh, Scripture. God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. He became the incarnation of God. And that's really what I am supposed to be in my world. I'm supposed to sort of flesh out uh, who God is by the way I live and speak and the attitudes that I have towards others. So we're sort of an incarnation of who God is. And that's really Jesus came to explain the Father uh, as we read in John chapter 1, verse 18. So we need a, a good understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so I hope you're there at Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. Let's look to see what is said of him here. Chapter 1 of Hebrews, verses 1 through 4. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So in this passage, please note that Jesus reveals the glory of our great God. He reveals the glory of God. Notice in verses 1 and 2 that Jesus is God's final revelation to his creation. We see that God spoke to his people through his prophets in the past, according to verse 1, long ago at many times, over a period of approximately 1,800 years from the patriarch Job, probably about 2200 B.C., until Nehemiah, about 400 B.C., over these 1,800 years, God spoke to us in the Old Testament Scriptures. Remember, the Old Testament was written in 39 different books. The Old Testament has 39 books. And how many does the New Testament have? 27. 
and totaled 66 books given uh, to reveal the Lord. Uh, notice that the Old Testament was written in different historical times over the 1800 years. It was written in different locations. It was written in different cultural settings. And it was written in different settings and situations over the years. He revealed himself in many ways. He revealed himself in visions, in symbols. He revealed himself in parables, in poetry, and in prose in Scripture. Uh, he revealed himself through literary forms that varied in style. But it was always God's revelation of what he wanted his people to know about him. The Old Testament described God's program of redemption uh, from the fall of man in Genesis 3 to the provision of a Savior as we come to the New Testament. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, and you might just note this reference, 1 Peter 1 verses 10 through 12, Peter says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The Old Testament revealed God's will for his people. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And what a wonderful hope we have revealed in God's word, Old and New Testaments. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, we read here in Hebrews chapter 1. Our fathers is a reference to Jewish people of former days. He was revealed by the prophets a reference to the Old Testament prophets who spoke forth the word of God. That's really what a prophet did, was speak forth God's word to his people. There were many different prophets who prophesied only in part. And you could name some of those prophets of the Old Testament. Let me name Abraham. We don't think of him as a prophet sometimes, but certainly through Abraham, through Moses, uh, through Elijah, Isaiah, Daniel, through the minor prophets, God revealed himself partially uh, through these different men, uh, revealing himself to his people. God speaks to his people through his son in these last days. We're reading here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. But in these last days, the author of Hebrews says, the Jewish people saw two different ages throughout human history. The first age was the current evil age of rebellion and sin against God. The second age that they refer to is the coming age of righteousness that begins with the coming of the Messiah uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So just these two time references uh, to the evil, rebellious time and then to the time when Messiah would come uh, in the power of the Spirit. The last days, when you read about the last days in Scripture, really refer to the coming of Messiah and his finished work on the cross. That really begins the last days. We are in the last days ever since Jesus' first coming in order that he might die on the cross. So he has spoken to us in these last days by his son. In the, in the past, God gave revelation through his people, his prophets, his spokesmen. But with the coming of the Messiah, God spoke the message of redemption through the person of Messiah, Jesus Christ.
Christ. It's more than a revelation through words that came through Jesus. It's God's revelation through a person. He revealed God to us in everything that he did, in all that he is. He reveals his Father. Jesus is the Logos. We read in the New Testament, Logos is a word that means word. He is the word of God. We read in John chapter one, uh, which is a great encouragement. Uh, But being the Logos or the word, uh, his total deity, his whole personhood expressed who God was. In John chapter 14, I'd encourage you to turn there in the New Testament, John chapter 14, and verses 8 through 11. John chapter 14, verses 8 through 11. We read this, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. With the coming of Jesus the Messiah, we have God's final word to us from God. And it's much more than just the word of the prophets, the word of men, of humans. It's the word of God himself. It's the word from the one who is the word, God the Son. Jesus reveals the glory of our God. Going on in Hebrews chapter 1, notice what is said of him. In verse 3, we read, And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What is verse 3 telling us about the Lord? Let's just have some interaction here. What is verse 3 telling us about him? When it says he is the radiance of his glory, what do you suppose is being said? the radiance of God's glory. Do you suppose it's telling us that that he reveals the glory of God in his life, in his teaching, uh, in his work, all that he did? Uh, He reveals God's glory without any any blurring of, of the beauty of God. It says he's the exact representation of his nature. What is being said here? The exact representation. What comes to mind when you think of something that's an exact representation? Perfect. um, He's our perfect one to look to. Okay, he's perfect. He reveals God. Uh, exactly. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's an exact, he is an exact representation of God's nature. Uh, what about the encouragement that comes next and upholds all things by the word of his power? Well, he comes as a perfect example for us to follow. Okay, we need to follow his example as we see his life and in revealed in Scripture, in the New Testament especially upholds all things by the word of his power. How should that encourage you today? 
okay? Everything's under his control. Everything's held by him. Uh, he sustains all of creation. Certainly we're a part of that sustaining work of his. So if we pray to him and our prayers are not answered immediately, we shouldn't be um, okay. downcast or, or he knows what's best for us. God knows what's best for us. He knows the best timing. Uh, when we send up a prayer, he doesn't always answer exactly as we might want him to uh, in our time frame, but be patient. God's working out his perfect plan, and the timing is perfect as well, isn't it? All things by the word of his power, his dunamis, dynamite power, which is available to you and me. And then in verse 3, at the, towards the end, it says, when he had made purification of sins. How did he do that? We've just celebrated it here this morning. He, he had to pay the price of our sin. Remember Romans 6.23, what does it say? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he had to pay that price, that high price, uh, by shedding his, his blood. And only he could pay the price for all of us uh, because he was without sin. He was a perfect sacrifice, the unblemished lamb uh, that had to, to sacrifice his life that we might be able to enter into his salvation. But notice, after he had made this purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So where is Jesus today? He's in heaven. Remember, remember Jesus spent how many days after the resurrection on earth? I think 40. 40 days after his resurrection. Remember, he spent time with his followers uh, there's a wonderful account of Jesus down by the Sea of Galilee. And what is he doing there with his followers by the Sea of Galilee? Do you remember? They had a fish fry. Yeah. Okay. And he shared that meal with his followers. That would have been a, a wonderful occasion to be a part of, wouldn't it? So after his 40 days of revealing himself to his followers, and, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one time there were 500 followers together who saw the resurrected Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about that. And Paul says in that passage that many of those 500 are still alive if you have any questions about what they saw concerning the resurrected Jesus Christ. But after the 40 days, remember, he ascended back into heaven. His followers saw him ascend into the sky. Uh, and the promise was that he's going to come again in just like manner uh, to come in the clouds again for his people. I believe that's a reference to his coming for the church, for his people uh, at the rapture. He's going to come. We're going to meet him in the air. Remember, Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, they have usually six feet further to travel. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we who are alive uh, will be caught up together with them in the air. So what a glorious truth that is. But right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing at the right hand of the Father for you and me. He's answering our prayers for one. Answering our prayers. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. He is our advocate, the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, an advocate is what? In, in a legal sense, he is a lawyer, a defense attorney. Uh, so Jesus... Somebody on our side, that's a good way to put it. Jesus is on our side, uh, interceding for us before the Father. As we fall into sin, uh, as we do things that are not pleasing to God, we have an advocate with the Father. What a wonderful truth that is. Without that advocacy, uh, we would be forever 
lost. So he's at the right hand of the majesty on high. And notice in verse 4 that he has become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. What is the job of the angels? Remember there are good angels and fallen angels. Uh, let me ask, what are, who are the fallen angels in Scripture? Satan, those who have followed in Satan's rebellion. Remember a third of the angels followed in Satan's rebellion. What did Lucifer want, even though he was one of the highest of the angels created? He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be like God, didn't he? He wanted to take the place of God. And that's really the sin of mankind, isn't it? Uh, it's, when I fall into sin, I'm saying I'm disregarding God's control of my life, and I'm saying I want to do it my way. I want to be sort of the ruler of my, my own destiny, do it my way instead of God's. Uh, but what is the ministry of the good angels? Okay. They're ministering spirits, we read here in Hebrews chapter 1. Notice, if you turn in your Bibles to verse 14, the last verse of chapter 1, it's speaking, the writer is speaking of the angels, and he says, Are they not all ministering spirits? Ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Uh, we have guardian angels. We have angels that are on our side uh, as we live out our lives in this dark world that we find ourselves in, ministering Watch spirits. They're watching out for us. I believe they will accompany us as we enter the Lord's presence one day. So having the proper understanding of who Jesus is is vitally important as we live in this Advent season. Uh, we're remembering who He is, what He came to do at His first coming. He came to save His people from their sins. Uh, but this season should be one of preparation, of heart preparation, of being right with the Lord, uh, because we do not know when we'll stand suddenly before Him. Could be at the coming of the Lord, at the rapture. I believe he's, that's the next thing on the uh, prophetic calendar. He's going to come for his people, the church, the true believers, going to catch them up to be with himself. And then there's tribulation and a thousand year reign of Christ coming in the millennial kingdom. Uh, there's that future thing happening. Uh, but any of us could enter the Lord's presence even today. Uh, we don't know how many days we have. Only the Lord knows. He, he knows the number of our days. And just like recently, we've share, I've shared in three funerals in, the, in less than two weeks, I believe. And we don't know when our time will come up. Uh, so we need to be ready, having prepared hearts for the second Advent. That's what Advent season should be for us.